Howdy, everyone. It's Bradley Stalder, and this is episode two of the Best Bell Fantasy Football Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. In episode one, I drafted live for my first submission in the Drafters Million NFL Best Ball Championship Tournament. If you want to join, use the promo code BESTBELL, one word, for an additional $10 added to your first deposit. That's promo code Best bell on drafters.com. Throughout that pilot episode, I referred to a statistic I haven't seen referenced much elsewhere percentile adjusted rate or PAR, P A R. Percentile adjusted rates use the formula one minus percent rank of a range of data at a particular threshold. So, for instance, if I wanted to know the percentile adjusted rate of how often Cooper Cup had scored 24.7 fancy points over the last three seasons, I would use the one minus percent rank formula over the range of games from the past three seasons. It's pretty simple, but it's a powerful formula which can give us a glimpse into the trends players have shown over a given period of time. And I think this par can give us a new way to look at fantasy football players, in particular best ball formatted league players. And this is where this best bell fantasy football name comes from. Instead of viewing a player's performance as a singular statistic, fantasy points, fantasy points per game, we should view the player's performance as falling somewhere on like a bell-shaped curve. We have to consider a player's range of outcomes and should be very concerned about that player not only getting an 84th percentile outcome every week. And the reason why I use 84th is because that is a standard deviation away from the mean. So I'm concerned about a player getting their 84th percentile outcome, but also that the 84th percentile outcome is worth the acquisition cost come draft time. And while I'll be speaking about best ball outcomes and strategy, viewing players, you know, that's that's the ceiling that can be helpful in redraft and dynasty leagues as well, not just best ball leagues. And while this concept of a player's range of outcomes is not a new concept, we've seen it thrown around Twitter a lot, uh, ESPN even integrated this nice bell-shaped curve in comparing fancy players by powered by IBM Watson. We've seen these things used sparingly here and there, but the application of percentile outcomes has not caught much steam among best ball drafters, especially high volume drafters. And that's what I'd say. One critique of the high volume drafters in best ball tournaments is that their player takes tend to be softened by the need to diversify. They'll say, I like this player, I don't like this player. These these similar players fall in the same tier. And, and while that may be true somewhat, that's still a perception, right? That many times these tiers are not statistically based, but, but like in their head, they've created these own ranges of outcomes or, or players that they are comfortable taking in the same spots. Instead of saying historically, these players have achieved this ceiling and and they're also going at this particular ADP. Therefore, they should be drafted in similar. Like that's not what my experience has been of in talking with best ball drafters and said they create their own tiers. So that's one critique of the high volume drafters is that their takes for individual players are often softened because of the need to diversify. And diversification, it's necessary for volume drafters. Injuries happen, and we tend to make mistakes in player evaluation. There's a lot of things that we get wrong in evaluating players because we have a singular take. This player is good. This player has upside. This player doesn't have upside. But there's not a fuller picture to be able to say, you know, this player, this percentage of the time over the last three years has hit these uh, points per game thresholds. So that's where a player's PAR stat comes in. For example, Joe Burrow's ADP at quarterback six on drafters.com doesn't initially seem out of place. We love the Bengals offense. They're a pass first 
offense. Burrow throws passes to two of the budding star wide receivers in the league, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins. But Joe Burrow's par of scoring 22 fantasy points, and the reason why I use 22 is, is because that's near the average quarterback six finish per week. So we don't want just the back end quarterback one in a league. We want the top half right of our quarterback finishes. We want that elite ceiling. So Burroughs par of scoring 22 fantasy points has been 24.6% over the past two seasons. Now that's about a quarter of the time. Even last season, Burrow coming off of the ACL tear. He was a quarterback six percentage or higher at 27%. So his par for quarterback six was only 27%. In short, Joe Burrow was only achieving quarterback six-ish numbers or better 27% of the time last season. And that's inclusive of the playoffs because that allows us to have a better data sample. And also, um, in the playoffs, you have uh, you have players who, who are, they're competing at the highest level. They want to win. There's a high level of competition. If anything, uh, you want to include these games in the data sample so that we can see what kind of upside can be accessed because preseason games are, are very difficult to do that. But postseason games, we definitely see players elevate their games or they're exposed um, against some of the better teams. Now, Joe Burrow, as I said, last year, 2021, 27% of the time was quarterback six type of numbers or better. Now you're saying, well, 27% to get like a, an upper echelon threshold, that's that's pretty good. A quarter of the time he's getting there. Even if he doesn't get there, he'll probably be close. <clears throat> but let's compare that to Tom Brady's par of 52% last year and 44% the year before. Or Russell Wilson, 34% and 44% each of the last two years. Or Dak Prescott's, 46 and 64% respectively. Or Aaron Rodgers, 47% and 80%. In fact, Joe Burrow's par is pretty in line with Kirk Cousins, who also has two star receivers in Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. Cousins, primarily a pocket passer like Burrow, only achieved a 22-point par of 28.6% and 32% of his weeks each of the last two seasons. Whereas, and this is where some of the insights can come in, and that may change your mind, whereas around and a half later, at quarterback nine, Jalen Hurts, at quarterback at 980p on drafters.com, hit a 22-point par last season at 45.5% of the time in his first year as a starter. Nearly double the rate of Joe Burrow. Yes, we're aware of the rushing upside, but now Jalen Hurts has A.J. Brown to throw passes to, in addition to Devonta Smith and Dallas Goddard. The consensus, I think, is too low on Jalen Hurts. And it may be sexy to stack Bengals. Drafting Jalen Hurts, though, is a plus EV choice, given that he's going to more consistently get you the upside that you want. OK, and they've added an alpha wide receiver to his receiving core this offseason. Now, it is a useful tool, this par. It's a useful tool, but I offer caution. A limited sample size can paint an incomplete or unhelpful picture of a player's performance. Last year, Michael Thomas, straight zeros. Right in best ball leagues, he was a donut. He didn't play a single snap, and this was due to miscommunications and timetable issues with his surgery. However, the missed games didn't count against his three season par stats. Nearly 70% of the time over the last three seasons, Michael Thomas scored at least 15 and a half PPR fantasy points in games that he played. Now, 15 and a half PPR fantasy points 
Some may think, oh, that's not very much. Or some may think that's a lot. But that 15.5 PPR fantasy points is about the amount that you need to be, uh, you need for your flex position in your best ball tournaments. You want your flex spot to get 15 points. Now, it comes down to ambiguous risk tolerance for a manager to draft Michael Thomas as the wide receiver 24. Because that's where he's going right now, in the middle of the fifth round. Could he be a zero again this year with more drama? Maybe he tweets out something or um, <laughs> maybe he pushes his timeline once again. But he could return to form as a top five wide receiver. At least Thomas has shown the ability to achieve 24.7 PPR points. Whereas players drafted around him right now, they can't access that type of ceiling. Over the last three seasons in games Michael Thomas has played, he's hit 24.7 fantasy points almost 30% of those games. Once again, 24.7 fantasy points is the the amount of fantasy points you want for your wide receiver one spot in these best ball tournaments. If you go higher than that, then you can afford to, to scale back a few other positions. But 24.7 is about the number that you want to be filling in and being highly competitive. Whereas Juju Smith-Schuster with an ADP of wide receiver 27. So he's going three wide receiver spots and three picks after Michael Thomas at, at 58th overall has hit 24.7 fantasy points less than 5% of his games over the last three seasons. And we know Juju struggled with injuries. Michael Thomas has struggled with his injuries. So they may not be the exact same situation, but we're talking about vastly different players with significantly different upsides. Thomas has been six times more likely to be a wide receiver one over that span. And look, you may be getting a solid wide receiver two or wide receiver three with Juju Smith-Schuster, especially now that he's on the Chiefs and Tyreek Hill is not there. But Michael Thomas has proven to access a ceiling. Juju simply hasn't shown. And in fact, we saw a similar scenario unfold over the last few seasons with Antonio Brown, an older elite wide receiver with drama problems who commands a hefty target share and he's a league winner, given the late ADP. And there's more, I would, have, I would say, going on, or that had gone on with Antonio Brown than with Michael Thomas. Like, Antonio Brown left games early. He exited due to injury. He took his shirt off and ran around the stadium. Aside from that, he switched teams. He moved from the Pittsburgh Steelers to the Oakland Raiders for a hot second. Well, actually a cold second because he froze his feet. To the New England Patriots, to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, han handling these legal situations, working up the pecking order, learning the playbook. All of that being said, Antonio Brown still accessed a ceiling of wide receiver six or better for a weekly finish about 11% of the time. He was accessing that elite ceiling twice as much as Juju Smith-Schuster in, in that same time frame. Michael Thomas may not be as discounted as Antonio Brown over the last few seasons, but let's look at other players drafted close to, but ahead of Michael Thomas right now, Jerry Judy. We're going to shift into a different perspective because Judy had a, had a tough year last year. He wasn't accessing ceilings, but even if you scale back to not wide receiver six, but wide receiver 15, mid-tier wide receiver two, over his career, Jerry Judy's par of getting wide receiver 15 is only 6%. 6%, maybe a tad better than Juju Smith-Schuster. Michael Pittman going ahead of Michael Thomas. His par of getting wide receiver 15 is about 16%. So it is higher than Jerry Judy, but still nowhere close to where Michael Thomas is, is over the last three years. Michael Thomas has shown to access wide receiver 15 in the games that he's played 44% of the games 
over the last three seasons. Now you're thinking to yourself, well, but he's been injured, he's been out, things like that. You can't replace Michael Thomas's upside later in the draft in the ways that you can replace Jerry Judy and Michael Pittman's productions. It may be jarring for you to hear this, but there is a wide receiver going in the 10th round that over the last three years has a higher par of scoring wide receiver 15. And that's Marquez Valdez Scantling. He's gone higher than Michael Pittman, higher than Jerry Judy, higher than Juju Smith-Schuster, 17.4%. Marquez Valdez Scantling needs to be on all of your best ball rosters right now. He's changing teams, sure, but he's making the rare lateral move from a Hall of Fame quarterback to what we expect is another Hall of Fame quarterback and from Rodgers to Patrick Mahomes. But what I'm getting at, bringing it back, Marquez Valdez-Scantling can replace the upside of Michael Pittman or Jerry Judy or Juju Smith-Schuster rounds and rounds and rounds later. You can't replace the type of upside that Michael Thomas has shown. He's irreplaceable. Now, there's a lot more to dive into this offseason for player takes and situations, projecting adjusted ceilings. But for now, hopefully you've started to think a little differently about how player outcomes may affect your draft strategy. And that'll do it for today's pod. Thanks. To all of you for tuning in. If you haven't subscribed to the Best Bell Fantasy Podcast, make sure you do wherever you listen to your podcasts. Make sure to check out the Best Bell YouTube channel where I'll be drafting live throughout the offseason. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at FF Stalder. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Next week, I'll start looking at Best Ball Stacks to Target. In the meantime, good luck in the Best Ball Streets.